part of the Startup Group Student Committee. I'm here to introduce you all to Mr. Paul Horn. Paul is a 2004 Penn State graduate who majored in IST. By his senior year, Paul has started his own company, providing remote IT and web design services to many clients across the country. After working for six Fortune 500 companies in the past 15 years, including Oracle, IBM, and Microsoft, Paul has seen many different perspectives from startup life to sales and business development at major corporations. One thing remains true across each experience. The ability to sell an idea and putting yourself in someone else's shoes is critical. So, without further ado, let's put our hands together and welcome Paul Horn back to Penn State. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Sure. Okay, sure. Perfect. Uh, so I appreciate the introduction, uh, and I wanted to uh, give you a quick background on myself uh, here in a second, go a little deeper than, than what Terry just uh, mentioned, but um, you know, the interesting thing out of all this is that when I started my career at Penn State, uh, like most of us, had no idea what I really wanted to do uh, after college. I knew that this was a great institution to be a part of, I used to a really great program, uh, the technology industry was really interesting to me, and so... Um, if you would have told me in 2000, when I started at, at Penn State, um, second class to go through the IST program, uh, and told me I was going to be a, sell, a salesperson for my career, I would have said, yeah, there's no way. Right? I was doing coding hands-on, web tech design, et cetera. So um, just very interesting to see where life takes us. Uh, so um, decades have blown away. I've been a Penn Stater for my entire life. I uh, was literally born at the hospital, overlooking Beaver Stadium. Uh, grew up in the area. Uh, my dad was getting his MBA uh, when I was born here at Penn State, and we just never left. Um, and now my mom works at Penn State, uh, the alumni association, uh, and you can see I moved away for two years. I moved away after I graduated to Boston uh, with IBM, and also to the Philadelphia area with IBM. And when I quickly realized that it didn't really matter where I lived, I could travel to anywhere from anywhere and work virtually, uh, it was just a no-brainer. You know, moved to State College and uh, was able to you know, basically work here for the past um, 12 years, right? working for all these big companies. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second as well. So again, 2000, 2004, second class to go through the ISD program. Uh, really cool time to be a part of Penn State. Uh, Penn State was making an investment at the time, and actually I'll I, yeah, <clears throat> have a little blast in the past in my slides. You'll see, I, I got carried away. We actually made yearbooks back when I was in, in college. And I'm not, I'm not talking about Z, I'm talking ISD yearbook. And it was just a collection of all the cool things that happened over the course of the year. Uh, and so I actually like opened the yearbooks and started going through it before, uh, before I, I came here today and, and realized, wow, there's some cool stuff in there. So um, history of the building, I'll talk about some of that in just a second. Um, try not to get too far off ta topic from a, uh, talking more about sales, but we'll get there eventually. Um, after graduation, I was with the ISC Alumni Society. Uh, it's something I highly encourage you all to participate in. Uh, if you have the opportunity to do so, it's a great networking opportunity, a great way to stay in touch with some of your uh, former classmates and really see where everybody ends up. Um, it's, it's cool. It was cool to be a part of that over the years. And by 2010, I was the president-elect. 2012, I was the president and had two years of past president as well. And as part of being the president, I had the opportunity to sit on the IST advisory board, um, which was comprised, still is, but at the time was comprised of some really interesting people, CEOs of major corporations, CIOs, um, and we had the opportunity to meet them and, and still to this day maintain a lot of those connections. So um, just a great experience overall. And then finally, um, again, just a quick show of hands. Who here, and I think most people play seniors. Yeah, okay. Okay. So uh, when you graduate, right, whether that's May, August, December, whatever that is, um, you will get a free membership to the Penn State Alumni Association. Uh, and that's good for one year, and uh, and then keep it up, stay active. It, Penn State has the largest dues-paying uh, alumni association in the world. Uh, it's one of the coolest things to be a part of. There's 580,000 alumni currently living out there, and there are about 180,000 of those that are actually members of the dues-paying members of the alumni association. So, highly recommend it. Stay stay connected to to Penn State. Um, it'll it's amazing how many times I've walked through airports. And I, every time I travel, every time I'm on a plane, especially when I'm coming home to, to State College, I wear a Penn State shirt of some kind, a right? polo shirt or whatever. And I, every single time, I get someone in the airport shouting out, we are. And like this has happened in Heathrow, in London, it's happened in Rome, it's happened in San Francisco, Seattle, San Diego. Um, I even had Little Rock, Arkansas. 
small little airport, and it's out of, out of the, we're, every, we're everywhere. So, highly recommend Stay Connected. It's, it's a great resource as you grow your career and, and maintain your network. <coughs> so, the history lesson. When I graduated, so it's 2003, so I graduated in 2004, but this, this was the cool technology at the time. Right? So, iPod just came out. This is awesome. <coughs> really neat. You know, this is all your music in one spot. You didn't have to walk around with CDs in your backpack. Um, the USB jump drive, like we're running the whole presentation this morning off of a USB jump drive. This was a novel idea. Um, the, the, the Nokia N-Gage. I've never even had one, I don't even know what it is, but it's, it's, uh, this was a fairly cool tech. Uh, and same thing with you know, the, the, HD, the DVD camcorder. Like this, you know, nowadays we don't even think about this, right? Nobody has these things. And um, it just shows you how much changes so fast. And then obviously, here's myself and a couple pictures I found. Um, I've changed a lot too. Put on a couple weight, have a couple kids now, family, um, life changes. Um, also another blast from the past. Actually, here you guys are gonna take that. Here's your professor, Allison, right there. Student government. Um, here's Mark Friedenberg, right there, another professor at ISD. So it was pretty cool being on the ISD student government. Um, I was the president of student government in uh, 2002, 2003. Um, but it was just amazing to see the, the, that take off and, and be a part of ISD today. ISD building. I actually gave tours of the ISD building. So the CEO of Xerox, Ann Mulcahy at the time, came in in 2002 uh, and wanted a tour. And so we gave her one. And we had the hard hats on and had special t-shirts made up that had this logo on the, the top, you can see. Uh, and we gave, you know, so the, the building was being built as the program was being built. So it was really, really cool to be a part of that and see all that. Um, and the building was actually completed in November of 2003, so uh, for my senior year, classes were able to be held here. Uh, however, I never had a class in the building uh, because uh, at the time, the classrooms were too small to accommodate the class size we had over in Buki, which is where all of my classes were. So just interesting history. Like, you don't even think about that. If you're in this building, you're part of the ISD program, this, this is it, right? But this, this all had to be built from the ground up, and it's just cool to see that change. Um, and here, obviously, here's where we are today. Now it's Westgate Building, but I, I prefer this this picture. Uh, <laughs> um, and here's the underlying theme here: change is the only constant. Okay, so there's a um, many people are quoted as saying this, and uh, you've got folks, everything, everyone from uh, Steve Jobs, right, or Bill Gates, right. And everyone brings this to light in a lot of their big presentations that they give, whether they're releasing a product or talking about their company. Uh, but, but this was actually, this, this was attributed, this quote attributed to, to Heraclitus, who's an ancient Greek philosopher, um, back, I think it was 500 And if you identify this early on in your career, you will succeed so much faster than if you don't. And the reason I bring this up is that what I quickly learned from being as a part of Penn State, part of the ISP program, was that we weren't here to learn about the coolest and newest technology. That was just happened to be the soup du jour, right? We were here to learn about how to learn about technology, right? And so if you can stay on top of everything that is coming through today, and you learn how to stay on top of all the technology that's coming out tomorrow, you will be successful. So we're here, we're learning how to learn, not necessarily learn the technology. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my career experience. Uh, so I started actually out of high school, graduated high school on a Saturday. From State High down the road, and um, ended up going to work for Raytheon. Had an internship starting on Monday, and I was doing web design uh, as well as database management as, and uh, network management. Um, really cool experience. And actually, um, talking about a second, I actually had an offer from Raytheon coming out of college so to go with them doing a top secret uh, clinic uh, project. Uh, Would have been pretty cool, um, but we'll talk about those options in a second. And then. Um, my manager at uh, Raytheon informed me that he wanted me back, but he said two years is enough, go out and learn some, someplace else. And if you really like Raytheon after the next two years of internships, come on back, we'll have an offer on the table for you. And so I went and I worked for uh, my cousin, who was starting up uh, two companies in Denver. And uh, they were basically a mortgage company that was trying to leverage the technology that was current at the time. So Excel spreadsheets were, you know, the norm at that time. So we, uh, if anybody, anybody's in the movies or in the room, see the movie Office Space. Okay, if you haven't seen it, go watch it. 
we're prior to watching for anybody looking to go in the corporate world. Um, but they had this report called the, the TPS reports. It was the bane of everybody's existence in that movie. And so we made the TPS reports, the total paperless system, because we were tired of printing out huge papers of documents for every single closing that we had for the client that was going to get a mortgage. And so we managed everything digitally. We managed the whole lead flow of mortgages uh, online through a web interface that we built out in Java and Oracle backend. Um, and this was pretty cool stuff. And uh, actually, by the time I came to uh, leave from Denver to come back to, to Penn State for my senior year of college, um, they said, hey, look, we can't, we can't afford to keep you on as a, an employee. We want you to start your own company, and we want you to contract out to us all of the IT that we need. So when they had a new employee start, they would FedEx me overnight a laptop. I would configure it, FedEx it back overnight. And I would fly to Denver once a month for a weekend, and I would do on-site troubleshooting and fixing and setting up new systems. <coughs> fly back, do classes the next couple weeks, fly back out. It was actually a pretty cool gig. And I ended up getting three other clients in the Denver area. So when I flew out over the weekend, I was kind of making the rounds and, and uh, you know, had the opportunity to learn, like, hey, this is something that's needed, right? The mortgage industry had a significant, they still do, by the way, but they had a significant lack of technology at the time. We needed people who knew what they were doing. So here was a, a, a skills gap, and I was able to provide some answers for that. Um, so that was where foreign technology consulting was going. So um, working from my apartment, doing all this kind of stuff, it was cool. I had a couple clients locally do website design, um, which, was, which was a lot of fun. And then uh, came time for graduation. And I looked at my client list uh, with, with foreign tech and said, okay, I could keep this going, I right? have to grow this significantly, or I could potentially look at other options. And so <clears throat> I had four offers on the table when I graduated from Penn State. One was to go back and work for Raytheon, and I would have gone the path of a Six Sigma uh, project manager, and eventually got Six Sigma Black Belt, which would have been really cool. Got the top secret security clearance. I even went through the fingerprinting process, and if I accepted, I was going to go and do the polygraph and everything from there. Um, I had an offer from my cousin to come back and work for him full time and get back truly into startup mode and you know, develop some new business ideas and, and companies with him. And then I had two offers from IBM, and the first one came from IBM Consulting, and it was a, a role working for the public sector team down in Washington, D.C., uh, working on big time public sector clients and just you know, picking up whatever needed to be done, whether that was ERP consulting, picking up SAP skill set or Oracle skill set, whatever was needed. And the last offer, which is the one I ended up taking, was to go to work for IBM in sales. And the reason I chose that offer, because I looked at, I looked at all four of them, and I said, okay, I could go the consulting route. I, probably 80% of my peers went that route after college. And that was really great. A lot of people working at Accenture, Deloitte, KPMG, uh, you name it. The, you know, they had great careers. And I looked and I said, okay, I could go the startup route. And then I said, okay, I could go the government defense contracting route. And with all those, I said, okay, I know the technology already. I'm not worried about that. Um, I feel like I have a good handle on those already. But my skills gap, personally, was sales. And being able to go out to somebody and have a conversation, understand their issues, and identify potential solutions to help them succeed. And as a result, drive business that way. And so, <clears throat> I had an offer from IBM to go to IBM Global Sales School after graduation, and went through a six month <clears throat> rigorous classroom training, um, doing everything from mock <coughs> sales, uh, sales uh, uh, you know, customers where you're sitting in a room with you know, three of your peers and one person is there as a customer, and you gotta pretend that you're in a sales environment and, and trying to sell them something, right? But, Consultatively, right? Understanding their issues, really digging deep into what their business looks like and how you can provide answers for them and, and make them more successful. Um, great process. It's definitely been the foundation of my career and allowed me to get to where I am today uh, because of that. And I actually still run into people that uh, say, wait, you went back in global sales school? That's, that's amazing. That's such an incredible program. Um, so it has a, a ton of uh, brand recognition within the industry. And one of the interesting things I did is I, I took the skill set, so, so everything wasn't completely new. I wasn't going in and selling from day one and you know, learning how to do this you know, all over again. Um, but I, I took with me some of the technology that I learned at IST. Learned a little bit about SAP, learned a little bit about Oracle. And so I supported them as partners. And so throughout my career, you can see most of my title, when you walk in the door, I'm actually a national partner sales executive. And what that means is that I manage sales partnerships between two companies. So the company I happen to work for and the company that I'm managing a partnership with. And I manage partnerships with SAP, Oracle. Uh, I was a Microsoft partner for six years before joining Microsoft where I am today. 
Uh, and then I also uh, manage partnerships with smaller firms, like um, some of the object storage companies out there, Cleversafe, which was acquired by IBM a couple of years ago, uh, Scality is a big one out there today, uh, and SwissStack, which is an open source uh, cloud object storage technology. Uh, and then in 2006, I had the opportunity to go work for Sun Microsystems. Uh, if you look up Sun Microsystems today, it'll take you to Oracle. Uh, but Sun was a really cool, technolo really cool technology company. Um, and actually, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the people at Penn State, you know, I, I started doing uh, computer science uh, classes on Spark Platform, which was uh, the Spark Workstation is something that Sun developed. So going to work for Sun was kind of a, a cool, really interesting thing, another big name brand uh, recognition. But they were acquired Oracle in January of 2010. And so by June of 2010, oh, I started one photography at the time. I'll talk about that in a second. <clears throat> in June of 2010, I went to work for uh, HP. And at that time, I was looking for something cool and unique and interesting to do. And uh, I was looking for a creative outlet. <coughs> and so um, I took the opportunity to pick up photography. My wife and I were going on uh, one of our first big international trips that we did together to Italy for 10 days. And we uh, got a, a camera, uh, a super cheap one. Uh, DSLR and ended up um, taking some really cool photos and that actually spawned foreign photography um, which I still have this to, to this day it's kind of it's less of a business more of a creative outlet but because there's demand for the photos that I take I set up a full, full storefront online and people go out and buy my photos today so like that photo of the ice cream building that's one of the ones that I take that I took a number of years ago um, but for the front page I don't know if you guys caught that but the title slide is the corner room with a cat of us driving by while I'm exploring the photo so at the end again, but um, just really, really that's that's you got to have something to keep uh, life fun and engaging outside of work, and this has been my outlet. Uh, in 2015, my manager from HP went over to Seagate and wanted me to come work for him, and uh, I ended up uh, working. Uh, Seagate was doing some pretty cool and interesting stuff of trying to uh, invest in. Uh, full stack of their system. Instead of having just a hard drive layer in a particular server, they wanted to capture the full stack right, and go out there and potentially compete with some of the big guys like the HPs and the Dells of the world. Um, it, was a, it was a cool endeavor. I had the opportunity to manage the entire Microsoft relationship uh, there. And uh, unfortunately, business decisions happened and changes occurred as the change is the only constant. Uh, you know, as a result, I ended up managing some other partners. I managed a partnership with Intel, which was a lot of fun. Um, and it, by about this time last year, I was interviewing with Microsoft for an opportunity that popped up. Um, and that's where I am today. So I'm a national partner sales manager. I actually manage <coughs> partnerships with SI partners, so systems integrators. So you think of the Accentures, the Whites, uh, DXC, you know, these big systems integrator partners. Um, I manage kind of the, the next level of partner down, right, which is still nationwide presence. Um, and still, you know, good, uh, good name, good reputable brands in the industry, um, but but doing different types of engagements, maybe not being as complex as some of the big guys. Um, so I've got five partners today that I manage, and uh, support the others. Yeah, question. That's a, that's a very good question. So about five or six years ago, I was actually coached um, by one of my old managers from IBM and Sun. He told me, look, you know, make sure you stick with some place for five years at least. Like, don't jump every year or every other year. It's going to be too much on your resume. And, uh, and so I, I took his advice. I stayed at HP for five years um, and you know, put in some real time there and, and um, established a name for myself within the company, which was great to see. Um, Unfortunately, HP was going through some changes. I probably would stay a little bit longer, but they were going through some changes at the time within their um, the business unit that I was in, and uh, I didn't think that those were changes that were the right direction for me, and so I ended up deciding to leave the company. But um, I'd say probably five years ago, that was a big concern. It really was, um, and so uh, I was making sure that I had something on the resume that showed some longevity. Uh, now I don't think so, and the problem is, and the reason I'd say that is because. Uh, companies will let you go with a week notice or a couple days notice, right? Um, there's no loyalty on the company part, right, uh, of the employees. And the companies that do have loyalty, um, it, it's incredible. There are a couple out there that are really good and have that kind of loyalty, but I've seen too many, too many people that put in 10, 20 years at a company and then they're shown the door 
that's around the lighthouse. And um, it, they found it, and, and whatever the reason was, it could be a location issue, they weren't based in the right place um, for the new business model being rolled out. It could have been um, a, an issue with skill set and maintaining you know, their ability to execute the business. Um, could have been any number of reasons. But I've just I've seen that too much, and I've, I've actually been asking a couple of my um, former colleagues that same exact question, like, hey, you know, I've got this blip of two years of Seagate on my resume, but I have five at HP, and I'm, I'm hoping to stay at Microsoft for five, 10, 15 years. What do you recommend? What are you saying about that? It's the past. So I would say coming out of college, you definitely want to do two solid years, same place, minimum, right? Maybe more. And then go from there and see where your career takes you. Because you just never know where the next opportunity comes from. Good question. OK. Um, I know it's been like half the time uh, talking about uh, talking about myself and, and background, but um, I wanted to bring that up there because there's a lot of interesting themes, and again, the, the underlying theme here has changed. Right? At the end of the day, I never expected myself to be in a sales role doing what I'm doing right now. But when you think of sales, think of Wolf of Wall Street. I've just seen Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah, okay, well, I do, I do. All right, so there's a lot of reference coming up about that. Um, <coughs> no surprise, probably. We think of the guy with the slick back hair, right? <coughs> Danny DeVito from the movie Matilda, right? Trying to, you know, these dirty used car sales guys, right? And, and you know, when you talk to these car sales guys, it could be further from the truth, but at the end of the day, like, they have a goal, right? They have a mission, in what they're trying to achieve, right? They have a number of cars sold target, a revenue target maybe for the month. And, uh, you know, they unfortunately sometimes have to do some crazy things to hit that number. So there is a stigma associated with that. But you can overcome that through value yourself, right? And so when you all are, and actually here, just quick show of hands, and, and if you don't feel comfortable answering this, you don't have to, but who here has been interviewing for jobs after college, okay? Uh, or going to graduate school, whatever. Um, who here has an offer today? Those are the go. okay, good. Um, so when you went through the process, did you realize that or not, you were selling, right? You were positioning yourself to showcase the best of what you have to offer to that company, to try and convince them to say, yes, we want to make an offer. And so that's something that you probably pick up along the way. You may not have been, might have been unconscious that you were doing that and going through that process, because that's what Penn State puts you through, is make sure that you go through the process of making sure that you know what you, what, you, know, you, know you have a strong foundation of skill sets to leverage, and you know you're going to be able to make an impact in whatever organization you end up in. And that's, that's one of the cool things about IST specifically is there are people, I have a good friend who uh, worked for IBM for a number of years, um, worked for Xerox for a couple of years, went back to IBM, and now he uh, decided to move to the Dominican Republic and start a, uh, a resort. He's actually building a resort right now. Um, and, <laughs> you know, who knows, right, what any of us could be doing. There's just incredible stories out there. <clears throat> so, this was me, first interview out of college. I was in New York City, um, actually, so the New York City interviewing for IBM, sales role. And the sales manager picks up the pen on the desk and says, sell me this pen. This is before Wolf of Wall Street came out. Like, this is, this is like, we're talking like 2004, right? And then the thing is going to came out 2012, 2010, something like that. And he handed me a pen, he said, sell to me. And I was completely caught off guard. Right? Because the whole time I'm talking about myself. And I didn't realize that that's not necessarily how you sell. Right? You sell through showing value to whoever your audience happens to be and, and giving them something that is interesting, piques their interest, that they take action on, right? And they change in some capacity. And so he wanted me to sell this pen to him. Now what I said is I said, okay, it's, it's a great black pen. It's got this awesome cap on it so you don't get any pen on your shirt and put it in your pocket. Um, and you know, it writes really well. And again, I had no prep for this, no idea. Now if you watch Wolf of Wall Street, you see this scene, right? Classic supply and demand, right? Where, you know, hey, write your name down on a napkin. I don't, I can't, I don't have a pen. Exactly, right, there you go. Pen's 10 bucks, here you go. Um, and so there's, there's a value sequence that's created, and that could be supply and demand, that could be showing the customer the impact that they could get through doing what you need them to do, make that sale of the pen, and you turn the whole entire scenario around. And, uh, so if, if you haven't seen this movie, it is, it's a bit of a crazy movie, but uh, this scene, take a little one when I'm sitting here, is actually one of my favorites uh, because of this scene uh, with the pen. 
So, um, first question. Does anybody have any questions? You feel free to, to raise your hand at anyone. Okay. So we'll do a quick crash course in sales. And um, this is kind of a bit of a shotgun approach. So it's not going to be like, you know, do this, do this, and do this, and you'll be successful. That's never the case. There's always a whole bunch of choose your own adventure paths. Um, and so you can get from point A to point Z in a hundred different ways. Yeah, go ahead. Can I just backtrack to the pen? Yeah. Now that you have the experience in sales, how would you approach the answer now? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. Um, so it, again, it, it's I would probably approach it this way, right? It's it's understanding. I would say, what do you what do you what do you need to do in the next um, you know week that requires some kind of pen? And, and you don't you can't ask that question because right? they won't give you a straightforward answer. You have to go around and, and do it consultatively. You have to understand what they're looking to do. And maybe you find out that that person is um, <coughs> starting a job soon, or they're taking a college course, and they need a pen to write notes. And all of a sudden. There's your hook, right? You know that, that you can provide some value by allowing them to take notes in their class. Um, but you have to develop that relationship, and you have to understand what they're looking to do. So you can't just walk in and say, I've got this great pen, right? And it's black ink. You know, there you go. You've got to talk with them. You have to understand what they're looking to do. Um, so yeah, it would definitely be a, a longer process. But at the end of the day, you're going to hook them so quickly there's no other option in their, in their mind, right? You, you're the guy showing up with the solution, the answer to all their issues, and they're gonna buy from you. Thank you. Yeah, good question. All right, um, I watched a couple of the other um, Startup Week uh, presentations. I don't know if you all have had the opportunity to do so as well. Um, but one person called out, um, I can't his name right now, but he called out that he would not be able to, stand, to sell anything that he couldn't stand behind, right, that he didn't believe in. And I believe in that too. Um, and so one of the things I ended up doing when I was at HP, um, helping to manage the Microsoft relationship, is I would go out and, and ensure that I physically saw the servers that I was going to be selling. I sold all of the HP hardware stack, server storage and networking gear, to customers that were looking to run specific Microsoft applications. And we customized the platform, let's see, customized the platform to actually provide optimized experiences on our platform uh, for, that, for that application. And so I had the opportunity to sit down at a keyboard, right, and, and see the application that we were pitching. I got to see all of the server stores, never here that we were selling, um, you know, pull out the, the individual, you know, trays of servers, and here's a, here's a uh, uh, HP DL 580 for you, sir, um, and, you know, see the guts of it see the technology that we built into it, so that I can have a more intelligent conversation with the customer and answer more of their questions that might be potential blockers, but I have to go back and find the <coughs> answer right in the room same, at the same time. And you know, that was invaluable. So always make sure that you can stand behind what you're selling, um, and that's, that's going to that's gonna help you go a long way. Um, today, I can't actually touch what I sell. I sell cloud. Um, and so, you know, that's uh, data centers that are um, so heavily armed that's more armed than Fort Knox, right? I can't get into it. Um, I think I've had one customer that managed to get into one for, you know, super high-level executive visit. Um, but you can't physically touch this. But, but the value you can sell is through the applications, through the solutions, and then bringing everything, I'll talk about in a second, bringing everything back to a business solution. It's going to add business value. 80-20 um, roll. This is so critical. I can't tell you how many people um, talk and talk and talk. And I know I'm doing a lot of talking at you right now, but uh, if we were sitting down and having a one-on-one -on -one conversation or a small group setting, I'd be doing a lot of listening. And that 80 20 rule, listen and talk, is absolutely critical. And you will come across so much more intelligently than you realize by listening. I've been in customer meetings where we had an hour meeting. I, was, I remember this one. I was in ACH Foods in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. And sitting there listening to their issues and what they're trying to do with the SAP environment and trying to position a Sun platform to help them with their needs. And we had an hour meeting with their tech team. I didn't say anything for 55 minutes. I just listened the whole time. I took notes. And at the end of it, I said, okay, let me just make sure I understand this right. You're trying to do this, which is going to impact this, which is going to show bottom line results here. And that, that really floored them. Right? And you know, the whole time they think I'm just sitting in the room, you know, just being you know, a junior guy, so I'm just out of college, and I'm just taking notes. 
Um, but the A20 rule is so critical. Know your audience or customer. Right? Walk in knowing that um, your customer's got, you know, uh, the person you're visiting talking to has got, you know, two kids in high school or they, um, you know, like to, you know, go out for brunch, at, you know, this particular restaurant. Like, you get to know them, right? I've got a, a customer right now um, who, it, it's just a funny, you know, it's a conversation just on the side. I found out that they used to go to the same restaurant that I used to go to in New York City every time I was in the city. Uh, this is uh, Bobby Flay's uh, Mesa Grill. Shut down a couple years ago, but it was one of the best spots. And we still, like multiple conversations we've had on that restaurant, reminiscing about it, but it drives that relationship with your client. Find the pain train. Who here knows about Triple T, Terrible Terry K? It's like old school. L look this one up. Look him up sometime. So Reebok did a series of advertising. Uh, I think it was like right before the Super Bowl. Uh, and then during the Super Bowl, and it is... Um, this guy was, Terry Tate was the office linebacker. <laughs> and so he was the enforcer in the office. And he would come in and, and if someone did something wrong or, or you know, like, um, you know, drank all the coffee and didn't refill it, right? he was there, you know, and he would do the pain trains coming, you know, and it's a hilarious, uh, hilarious ad. Go look it up. Um, but terrible Terry Tate and the pain train. But you want to find the pain train with the customers, right? You want to find out who is hurting by not taking action, right? Who's business is declining because they're not deploying the system they need to deploy or, or doing what they need to do to help make that business survive. And it's never just one person. It's always across multiple people, multiple organizations. Identify decision makers and influencers. Probably a no-brainer, but we often tend to not talking to who we feel comfortable with, right? And um, these people potentially are influencers, right? If I'm going and talking to an IT shop and having a great conversation with them, they most of the time don't own the budget to be able to do what needs to be done. And so this is a great opportunity to expand your horizon and find out who actually makes that decision, who signs the dotted line, cuts the check. Um, this is actually a line from this recent training I took in the fall called uh, Challenger Sales Model. The Challenger Sales Model is the concept of essentially showing your client or the person you're trying to influence that it's more painful to stay on your current path than it is to change. And that's the only way to get people to change. So I know you've had a couple of speakers coming here talking about some of these large ERP systems. I think there was a gentleman on Monday talking about SAP quite a bit. Yeah, customers don't upgrade SAP more than every five years, maybe every 10 years. Like CEOs would prefer you not touch their environment more than once you know, every 10 years. And so for you to be able to go in there and try and draw up some additional business with them and show them that there's increased value by upgrading the latest platform, that's critical, right? For you to have a shot at doing anything with that client. And so you need to show them this, that the, the change is actually gonna be easier than they realize it. And once you get them into that mindset and challenge their beliefs that maintaining the status quo is okay, you will get that change. Prepare for objection handling. How many here have heard the word no? From Something you want to do. You applied to a college you wanted to go to, got, you know, got shut down. Uh, apply for a job, right? I, I've had that. I need to do with Lockheed Martin. And they said, no thanks. <laughs> you know, it is what it is. Um, and so everyone hears that, but you have to be prepared for how you handle that objection, how you handle rejection at the end of the day. Tell the story, tie your solution to the actual business results. That's what's going to change the game here. That's how you're going to show some kind of movement um, nobody says, hey, that's really cool technology, let's, let's do that. You know, they say, okay, I can save a million dollars a year by deploying this, which is only going to cost me $250,000 to deploy. Perfect. Where do I sign? Right? So there's cost savings versus increased revenue. And again, this change is the only constant. That's what, what this comes down to. Um, I won't spend a ton of time on this, but um, whenever, and if, if you were to go look up uh, sales, and I'm trying not to say Google sales because I work for Microsoft, so say Bing sales, um, <laughs> you're going to find uh, a couple of interesting acronyms. Um, BANT, Budget, Authority, Need, Timeline. So whenever I went into a sales call uh, early on in my career, now I just do this naturally, um, I would actually write on the top right corner of my paper, BANT. And as I had conversations, instead of taking notes on everything that customer said, I would actually be like, oh, wait a second, they just mentioned budget. 
right? Oh, okay, this is the guy. It's not the person to talk to, but this guy over here is the decision maker. They have the authority to sign off on a $500,000 investment. Um, need, right? If you can illustrate that they really have need. By the way, this doesn't come out in the first conversation. It comes out in multiple conversations. Why you have to develop the relationship so you get the second call and the third call. And then eventually start looking at closing. Uh, and then you want to understand the timeline. Um, again, in the sales world, and, and you know, when you're in college here, you're focused on a semester time frame, right? Um, in the business world, it's quarterly. And so you're going to be looking for quarterly results. Um, or let's say, for example, let's say you're not in a sales role and you're looking to try and do something interesting and new in your company and you want to affect some kind of change that way. Funding is based quarterly everywhere. And so if you try and like this week is the worst week to go and ask for money because it's the last week of Q1. And next week is a great week to talk about money. And so you understand the timelines that exist and, and be able to position that, you'll have greater success. ABC. So here, does anybody see Glenn, Gary, Glenn, Glenn Ross? I, I, I never have, I've just seen this scene. Uh, Alec Baldwin talks about always be closing, right? Always be closing. Um, and that's something that is good and bad, right? But you want to you kind of keep your eye on the price, is what that means at the end of the day. And it's, it's good to have it smart goals. Um, if you haven't been, in, uh, been introduced to this with an IST, um, something that might be good to take on with you, not necessarily a sales methodology, but something that does come up. Again, you know, sales is very cut and dry. It's, it's we're starting here, we've got to sell the customer on something here, and we want to close it on this date, right? So it's, it's, there's a very clear vision in mind on what you're trying to get to. Does that vision always happen? Absolutely not. <laughs> right? But if you set up some smart goals to help you get there, right, that's, you know, measurable, smart, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time limited, it'll help to kind of take that conversation and direct you where you're looking to go. And if you take these and you, and you really boil them down and refine it further, you get something like this. So this is a conglomeration of different sales models that I've seen at, at different companies. But it's everything from identifying a lead or a prospect and then creating a strategy with that client on how they want to go out and deploy this and do what they're looking to do. Continue to present the value, prove the value out. Sometimes you have to actually go and do a proof of concept. And you have to say, look, you know, you can't don't take my word for it. Let's show you. Let's actually have your team sit down at these laptops and go through it. We do it all the time with all of my partners. And then finally, realizing the value, negotiating the terms, closing the deal. So when you boil it all down, right, you get something that looks like this. This is a slide that our CEO presents, actually presented to all of our partners, he presents his customers regularly. Um, on the left, these are Microsofts. I haven't talked a lot about Microsoft, by the way, because I don't think anyone caught that, but, um, but here, these are very Microsoft slides right now. Um, modern Workplace is everything from um, all of our uh, Office 365 applications, uh, Windows 10, Modern Workplace, and all the security products are there. Business Applications is uh, our CRM platform, our ERP platform, Dynamics, uh, among other things. Applications and infrastructure is where you get into the cloud. Right, and getting into Azure and leveraging the system center uh, or system center suite to get up into Azure, we kind of a hybrid cloud motion. And then finally, data and AI is what's actually some really cool stuff coming out, so keep your eyes open for this in the next three months. Um, we've got a lot of really cool things coming out about artificial intelligence. We had a briefing a couple weeks ago on that with one of my partners. Um, just game-changing stuff, uh, quantum computing kind of stuff. Um, and this is you know, your typical database and SQL Server platform. Um, but you bring this all together. We don't walk in talking about things on the left with our clients. They don't care. They're like, okay, great. You know, I use that. That's neat. But what does it really do for me? It empowers my employees. It engages my customers, optimizes my operations, and or transforms our products. And that's getting from the solution to the actual business outcome. You always want to have numbers behind this, right? Savings, $10 million or you know, increased revenue of 10x what they're doing today you know, because of added efficiency. Whatever that is, you drill down into that. But you're no longer having a conversation with people about, hey, I've got this cool sign your product. You know? You're talking about value for the device today. And I think, I, don't know if we're, I think we got, what, 10 minutes left? Okay. Um, so we'll leave some time if anyone has any q and I've got basically one more slide and I wanted to share this with you. Uh, this is our CEO, Satya Nadella, and this is Microsoft's mission statement. 
is to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. So did anybody catch a technology reference in there? No, there's not. It doesn't exist. Right? We're happy, we happen to use technology to increase the efficiencies, to add value to people's lives, to do things like provide technology in Africa to help them with um, uh, you know, help getting access to healthcare faster or information faster, um, you know, through, um, I've got a client right now, this is so cool, and, and um, I can't see any names, but um, there's uh, the idea of, of a connected ambulance, right, where you're using IoT, Internet of Things devices, on an ambulance to provide telemetry on the patient back to the hospital before they get there. Right, so they've already got all the readings ready to go. Like, that's so cool. It's going to actually save lives at the end of the day. Um, and there's just so many other cool stories like that that, that we've seen. Um, there was actually, we highlighted a story in July last year of a, um, an eye doctor in the United States, in Los Angeles actually, who was helping patients overseas in third world countries. Um, and basically there was a significant blindness issue with a couple of countries in Africa, I believe. And uh, yeah. <laughs> and so what he, what he actually did is, is he was able to get on and do a Skype call with the people who were, were in the third world country to help them do the surgery. So really interesting stuff um, and uh, just hope this was valuable and interesting to you. I think we're kind of going to that story. <laughs> but, Okay, so I, I, I always show some kind of impact. Um, so actually, I don't know. Um, Okay, let's try that. I'll show you, I'll show you what I have. Don't try to move my perception for you. some kind of numbers in there, you've got some kind of success in that. Um, supporting local startups within major corporations on several occasions, kind of an entrepreneurial route, you know, buzzword, um, and a multi-million dollar initiative, right? So you want to show like what you did to uh, have some kind of an impact. You want to show potential monetary value. Um, some of this stuff actually, I don't think I, yeah, I didn't have it in here. Uh, let me see if I put it in below with my various companies. Some of this I actually, most of this from my resume. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, now here, uh, yeah, I took all it out because it's, it's sensitive. You know, here we go. This is like, so. This is one of my first job out of college at IBM, um, and you can see here reference 150 million dollars joint investment that was made between the two companies I was working for. Um, 20 million dollars in revenue. You know, and it's not always money. It's not always money that's, that's the, the result that was achieved. Um, but you always want to start with, here's what I did. Here's the impact that drove. Um, and and that could be anything from, you know, I mean, one thing people, especially in IST, just always seem to forget is that every single class that you're in, you do some kind of a customer project. And it might be a case study, it might not be a real customer, but sometimes it is a real customer, and especially this class, 440W, you know, it is usually a real customer that you're having an impact in potentially. 
Whether or not they deploy your solution is another thing, and there's really not the time frame with this course to be able to, for you to see that. But if they do, right, you can estimate like, hey, they would have had this kind of impact. And so you've already had so much, you've had more experience than anybody else in any other degree at Penn State with hands-on experience. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I don't know, I'm gonna stop, that's good, so. <laughs> Like a couple minutes left. Yeah. It's <coughs> a good question. Um, so I went back to web development a little bit. Um, so there's actually a small bed and breakfast in Huntington, um, just out here about 45 minutes, that uh, I built a website in 2003 and um, had a full back end interface and, and whatnot. And um, they wanted to be able to manage it on their own. <laughs> Uh, and I built enough for them to do that, but I'd have to go in and tweak something. And so maybe 2010, 2011, I actually went back in, did a full redesign with them. We transferred everything over weekly, so they were able to manage everything themselves and make changes themselves. I showed them, I taught them how to do it. That was probably the last time I actually was like hands-on, you know, doing development. But um, possibly, you never know, right? At the end of the day, if I, you know, it, it's not a lot of if for me, it's a when I go out and start my own company, whatever that, that, that opportunity arises. Um, I will absolutely need to, you know, design a website, and, you know, build that first initial pass at, you know, getting the name out there, and, and um, so yeah, it definitely not uh, not saying no, but it, at the same time, it is so difficult because when you graduate from college, you know, there's very little free time after you know you're working so hard for a couple years that, that I lost a lot of the the knowledge I had around you know different coding platforms like Java or JSP. Yeah. So, like, if you, like, as you said, that you wanted to start your own business, you want to eventually be a startup, would you present yourself as an asset for sales, or would you present yourself as an asset for ISD? Great question. Um, I think with where my skill sets are today, it would be more of a sales asset. Um, and there's so many people that could do, uh, you know, application design or coding, you know, better than I could. Um, but that's also making the assumption that it's going to be a technology-based startup. I mean, who knows? Um, you know, you can take anything, you can do, do almost anything with this degree. And, you know, with the background of having technology experience, you know, I mean, outsourcing like a mobile app design, mobile app development, so cheap, right? Whether it's a company in the U.S. or a company in Brazil or Mexico or wherever, you know, they can do that work so much faster than, than I could, I know, for sure. Um, but I would probably start with the sales route to try and drum up that business to show the value of what I was trying to achieve um, and rely on others to help to, to build whatever it is we're doing. Is that a good question? Being in sales, I assume you are on the road a lot. How do you deal with that? Good, good, good question. Okay, so um, from 20, 20, or so 2004 um, to last year, I was averaging 50 to 60,000 miles a year on an airplane. Um, all domestically, so a lot of, lot of cross-country flights. Um, I was actually, um, I don't know if you guys know him, uh, Sean Knight, who was a, a professor at IST and then at Smeal afterwards. Um, he actually just started his own company, um, Maine Bay and Berry Company. Uh, they do fresh seafood deliveries from Maine and from uh, Maryland. I was actually just in at his store last weekend talking with him about um, that, that type of, of uh, thing on traveling. He actually mentioned that of all the people he stayed in touch with after college, he's one of my professors, all the people he stayed in touch with, um, I'm the one who travels the most. I was like, really? There's got to be other people doing a lot of international trips. And, and apparently I do, I travel quite a bit. So I've been to all these different, I've been to every major city in the U.S. multiple times. Um, been to Las Vegas, and this summer will be my 18th time in Las Vegas. Um, and that's cool and everything for a couple times, but after you lose a couple hands of <laughs> blackjack, that's it. Yeah, there they are, I'm done. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's uh, for for a while there, it was it was exciting, and actually for a long time, I, I took my girlfriend at the time and then my wife with me on a lot of these trips, and so she got to see the world as well. She was able to work remotely in some of her jobs she had in of college, um, and but now that I have kids, so my, I have, I have twins. They're four and a half years old, and. Um, the, within the first 12 months that they were born, I was trying to do trips to the West Coast and back so quickly that I was doing red eyes every single flight. So I, I did 12 red eyes in the first 12 months of their lives because I didn't want to miss anything. 
And that kind of triggered something for me. I said, okay, I need to slow down a little bit. So I slowed my travel the past couple of years. And the job I just took with Microsoft um, limits my travel for the most part to Chicago, Pittsburgh, and New York City. So very attainable to get there from here. Possible day trips to Pittsburgh out and back. Um, I miss very little of my kids' lives now, especially. Um, you know, like I took my son, they, he's a, uh, like the American Ninja Warrior show, he's a, he's a ninja warrior. He's a gymnastics, like, <laughs> he's around and has fun and he's four and a half years old. And I get to take him that every day, or every week, which is cool. Um, so it has been a struggle, without a doubt. My recommendation there is do as much travel as you can early in your career. Position yourself, if you want to travel, position yourself to go out there and see the world. And I have a good friend who, um, before he got married, he was in early 30s when he got married. Uh, no, he was 30. So basically about 10 years out of college, within 10 years, he did 2 million miles of airline travel worldwide. He was everywhere. He's been to 60 or 70 countries. Um, and it's just get that out of the way fast. Because when you have a family or, or you know, later in life you want to you know, do something different, that opportunity doesn't always present itself. But there's definitely a work-life balance that you have to achieve. I think we're out of time, but um, thank you so much, Mr. Thank you.